here. So we'll go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll get started and maybe a little bit later in the uh, service we'll show that. If you have a Bible tonight, I'd like you to go with me to John chapter 3 tonight. John chapter 3. And um, we are going to uh, be starting there in our service tonight. John chapter 3. And will we begin here... Um, Find my information. Everything's falling apart here tonight on us. All right. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 22, please. And the Bible says there, and the, after these things, Jesus and his disciples uh, came into the, the uh, land of Judea, and there he tarried with him and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and, they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between the, some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, and this is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. We started Vision Night, I, I don't know, I think back in the late 1990s, and we introduced a theme that, of which our church would revolve around. And uh, it, this, this night has become very special because really, in many respects, it kind of focuses our attention as a church ministry uh, on certain things. And so tonight... I want you to look at verse number 30. Our theme for this year is simply the word or this phrase, he must increase. He must increase. So that is where we're going to be tonight with that thought. So as we think about these words that were spoken by John the Baptist, I want to spend a few moments in dealing with them before we begin to recap last year and lay out some other things. But I want you to consider in this particular passage that what we have is John's testimony and John the Baptist, think about as we think about this man, he was really a very unique individual. He was a chosen vessel. And as we, uh, we, we see God moving in the New Testament era, he, he begins to, to move in that, that particular realm or that particular time. You, you have to remember, if you go back to Malachi, we have the, the silence of the voice of God. And God, basically, there's no, no prophet, there is no, uh, there's no vision, it's just, it's just God goes silent for 400 years until we see the circumstances that revolve around the life of, uh, of John the Baptist. And, and again, we see that God sends the angel Gabriel to speak to Zechariah. He's an older godly priest, and of course his wife Elizabeth, these two individuals have wanted to have a child and have not been able to conceive, and they're now up in years, no doubt thinking this is never going to happen, there's no way they're going to have a child, but yet Gabriel reveals to Zechariah that he and his wife would conceive this son who would serve in a very special capacity. So again, I want you to think, after 400 years of silence, God steps out, of, sends this angel to begin these, this process or to begin the, the circumstances that will bring about God's Messiah, and John is very much involved in that. Uh, if you want to turn to Luke chapter 1, you can do so. If not, please just listen. I'll be reading verses 13 to 17 that speak about this special child in the book of Luke. But the angel said unto him, speaking of Zacharias, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. You shall call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Listen, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him, speaking of the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So, uh, we know this child 
was born, grew into this powerful preacher. And John is really unique because he really spans what we would call two dispensations. You may hear that term dispensation. You may not necessarily know what it means. But basically, a dispensation is just God's dealing with people at a particular time. And so John spanned what we call the law dispensation. When God had given the law to the nation of Israel, he comes at the tail end of that. He's actually the last prophet and kind of closing out that section or session. And then he bridges the dispensation into grace by introducing Jesus Christ. You see, up to this point, through the law, offerings were to be made. The temple was to be utilized. The high priest was to make the offering of atonement once a year by taking that sacrifice and shedding the blood. But John the Baptist points at Jesus Christ and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so he sp- bridges these two dispensations. So John is used to in, uh, usher in what we would call this New Testament era. Now when we think about John's ministry, John's ministry was not long. But we certainly could say that it was effective that John was very powerful. John becomes a voice to awaken the nation of Israel to the fact that the time had come for their Messiah. Now, whether they completely received that or not, many people responded to the message of John the Baptist. So as we're looking at this text tonight here in John chapter three, I want you to notice a few things, that John's disciples and some of the Jews were a little bit, I guess, bothered by the fact of the ministry, growing ministry of Jesus Christ. Look again at verse number 22. And it says, and after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So Jesus comes out of Galilee, which is north, and he moves to the south to the region of Judea and begins, uh, kind of transplants his ministry there for a while and obviously is baptizing converts. He and his disciples are, are baptizing converts. Then we read in verse number 23, and John, John was also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison, verse 25, and there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes and all men come to him. So when we look at this word enon in verse number 23, it's a reference to a place. The word itself means abounding springs. So the indication is that John chose this particular place because there was much water there for baptizing and evidently Jesus was not far away, also using that same region to baptize. So John's disciples and some of the Jews began to question, if you look at verse 25, this doctrine of purifying. So we may say, well, what what is that about? What is he talking about, this idea of purifying? Well, this would be a reference, no doubt, to baptism. Uh, Because you need to understand, up till John, there was no scriptural admonition or doctrine about baptizing. So when it's talking about purifying here, uh, obviously their sins aren't being washed, washed away, but people are repenting. They're getting right with God, and they're marking that by a baptism. Uh, The Bible talks about the fact that baptism is an answer of a good conscience towards God and and is the washing, uh, is part of the the washing, but we don't believe in a washing away of sins. It's just the idea of, of, again, saying, hey, look, I'm right with God and I'm marking this moment, this decision in my life to be right with God by a baptism. So as we, we think about that, Up to this point, again, uh, there had been no teaching, and John now is baptizing, and so is Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 33, we're told that John got his, his decree, or if you would, or his authority to baptize from heaven. Now, I don't have time to get into that tonight, to go back and look at that passage, but I want you to understand that John didn't just one day show up and say, well, you know, I think I'm going to start this new idea of baptizing people. No, no, the Bible's very clear that God revealed to John, hey, John, your, your responsibility is to get, make ready a people, so when they repent, let's mark that, that decision by a baptism. And so John begins this, this idea of baptizing. He had heaven's authority to do so. So there's no doubt the question being debated in verse 25 is about baptism, because if you look at verse 26, it's very clear that that's the idea. Verse 26 basically says, and they, they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come unto him. So the, the question about purifying deals with baptism. So what we're seeing here, these disciples of John are seemingly, and maybe some of either some of the uh, Jews themselves, are a little bit, if you would, put out, maybe a little bit perplexed, maybe just even a little bit jealous for John's sake. 
And the indication is that Jesus' ministry of reaching people and baptizing them was increasing. So in other words, his ministry is increasing. More people are coming. More people are following after Jesus at this moment than are following after John. And, and so the disciples aren't happy. Well, I would point out as you look at verses 27 to 30 that John understands something. He understands his own particular role. He, he understands that, that God ordains roles. Look at verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Now, it's good for us to understand that God ordains and facilitates his plan and gives people to accomplish a purpose. So, so think about this. When we think about a church, we think about a body. Uh, we think about a physical body. The, the church is a spiritual body, but it's a physical body of Christ in a, in a location. So, so again, we, we don't believe in a universal, invisible body, but we do believe in a local body where uh, Christ is magnified or Christ is visible through his church. So if Christ is building his church, then Christ chooses who he places in his church, and then he gifts those individuals to be able to accomplish the, the ministry and the purpose. So when we understand that, it would be good for us, to, again, to, to understand that it's God doing what he's doing. He gifts us and gives us roles and responsibilities for the kingdom of heaven's sake, so that the body can edify itself, so the body can expand, so the body can carry out the work of the ministry. So if we understood this, if, if, again, if we could just understand this particular truth tonight, it would stop a lot of pettiness and jealousy, sometimes even among God's people. Uh, for instance, you know, some, uh, we heard Brother Doug Schweitzer sing here. God has gifted him with a, a wonderful voice. We have many gifted musicians here. So someone who maybe can't sing that well would say, well, you know, I, I, I wish I could sing like that. And it's almost a, a, an element of jealousy. Or, or someone, may, someone may come to me, and this, is, this happens many times, and say, boy, Pastor Pete preached a great message. You think I'm jealous about that? Are you kidding? I want that to be the case. There, there should be no jealousy or pettiness about us. We should be excited about the fact that God gifts people and equips people to do the work. And John certainly understood this. He said, look, it is God who gives us these abilities. So he understood his role. And, and, I, and I finally, he, he states his role. Look at verse 28. He states for us what his, his role is. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent from him, or I'm sent before him. He that is the bride is the, uh, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the, friend of the bri but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him, notice please, he rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, and this my joy therefore is fulfilled. So John lived, think about this, a, a very, very powerful life. He never tried to make himself great, but he lived this great, powerful, and godly life so that many people, John lived in such a way, think about this, that many people said, are you him? Are, are you the Messiah? Now, I don't know about you, but nobody's ever come up to me and asked me if I was Jesus. And, and I would be a little bit shocked that they would. But evidently, John lived in such a way, such a powerful life, so filled with the Holy Spirit, so filled with God, that people said, maybe that's him. And, and yet John said, look, I never tried to make myself that, but I've been sent before him. The religious leadership previously uh, obviously had come to John, and he told him he wasn't, that wasn't who he was. Uh, again, in John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23, we find this dissertation where John basically speaks and says, look, I'm not him. I'm sent before him. So the focus of John's ministry was calling the nation of Israel to repentance and making them ready to receive their Messiah. Because he was out in front of the people, people knew him, many followed him, many responded to his message. Now it's natural for people who have God's calling upon their life for preaching and leadership, they have people that connect with them and to gravitate towards them. So John, think about this, had many followers, disciples who were drawn to him. And these men had a natural loyalty to John because they saw him as someone God had used in their life to bring them to repentance, to help make them ready for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And so these men, by their natural loyalty, were some of the ones who were troubled by this growing predominance of Jesus' ministry. And they saw that that almost is a threat to John's ministry. But John speaks of what his ministry is, again, in verses 29 and 30. So let me just explain what he says there in verse 29. He, he mentions about he that hath um, the bridegroom, or hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth by him and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly. So let me just spend just a moment on what John was saying about himself. 
In John's day, the man who was the friend of the bridegroom, in, in many respects, became what was known as a liaison. He's a liaison between the bride and the bridegroom. And this person was a negotiator between the families. So he would go to the bride's family and, and, and negotiate. He'd go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, bridegroom's, uh, the, the bridegroom's family and negotiate. And, and he would bring the two together, these families together. He arranged the wedding. He was the one who gave out the invitations. And he presided over the wedding feast. And he was responsible to bring the bride and the bridegroom together. So when John is talking about this, it's not just saying, okay, it's not like he's just the best man of the wedding. No, no, there's much more involved in this. There, there's the idea that he's had a, an ongoing relationship between the individuals to bring them together. And, and, and according to Jewish custom, this man had a special job, think about this, of guarding the door to the bridal chamber on the wedding night. So on the wedding night, he's given the responsibility of guarding the door so that no other man can go in and it's dark, of course, it's the wedding night, and, and again, it's, it's, you know, it's dimly lit. So he's given the responsibility of guarding the door so that when the voice of the bridegroom is heard, he opens the door and lets him go in, closes the door, locks it, and walks away. John said, that's my responsibility. What he's saying is, look, I've fulfilled my purpose. I was put here for a distinct purpose. John was calling out a people. He was saying, hey! The Messiah is coming. Get yourself ready. He was trying to make ready a bride for the bridegroom. And he brought the two together. Unfortunately, that marriage was never consummated at that moment. Instead, there's a new bride. And you and I are part of it. It's the church that Jesus Christ established. It isn't the second plan. God obviously knew that. At a later point, he'll turn his focus again on the nation of Israel during the final days. But John fulfilled his purpose. John said... I am not the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bride. I've done my job. And so he said, for that reason, he must increase, but I must in decrease. John understood his calling and ministry. He did what he was given to do, and now his ministry is fulfilled, and Jesus would dominate the center stage of God's work for Israel. So this year, as a minister, we're going to focus on Jesus increasing. Let me just simply say to, to us as a people, that if that's gonna be the case, then you and I must learn how to die to ourselves. We must learn how to die to ourselves. You and I, we aren't the most important people in the world. Sometimes we lose sight of that. Many times in marriage, many times in uh, relationships, many times in even the church, uh, we get to a point where we say, well, it's, I've gotta have it my way. I, I want it to do it my way. And really it comes down to the, the fact that problems arise in a home they rise in, in the school, in the church, and in our lives when we make too much of ourselves. John, uh, I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul spent a considerable amount of time with the church of Corinth. Specifically writing to them, besides spending 18 months there starting this church and planting it, spent time in writing two epistles. In that first epistle, he corrects the problem that was going on in the church. They were making too much of, of men. They were making too much of leadership of people who had given responsibility of leaders over them, so much so that there were factions within the church because they were infighting. And, and John basically, or I'm sorry, Paul basically points out in that particular section, look, you need to understand that men, God gives them responsibility and it's all right to appreciate them, but you need to understand that they're just instruments and tools to do the work of God. The right kind of leader won't demand personal loyalty, but Christ-centered loyalty. He he, Christ, must increase, and we must understand that. So with that being said tonight, let me simply say to you, we, you and I, as a church, cannot make too much out of Jesus. Did you know that? Uh, we could never give too much glory, too much honor, too much, uh, too much worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can never make too much of him. I can't give him too much service. I, 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 I cannot give him uh, too much of my life. Uh, obviously, uh, he is worthy of everything that I can give to him. Now, we as a church, we don't need to be a bunch of loud and obnoxious Christians going around telling everyone how great Jesus is and then undermining that truth by the fact that we don't live our life for Jesus Christ. So the idea is, is that, okay, let's balance it. Let's have a voice for Christ. Let's tell people about how great Jesus is, but let's show them how great he is through our living. He must increase. That's the, the thought, the idea. So this world needs to see Jesus in our lives, and in order for that to happen, 
We need to get out of the way and allow Jesus to increase.